Hey there, everybody. Greetings from Moonshot, Mid-Atlantic. Not even mid anymore. We're more than halfway. We've got like 1,100 miles to go to the British Virgin Islands. I'm going to give you the full blog story of this trip, which has been very, very interesting. There's been a lot of learning opportunities, learning moments that I'm going to pass along to you guys, probably starting next week. This is more of an update, and I'm going to divide this kind of into a technical discussion that's broken into two parts. I'm going to talk about satellite communications, and I'm also going to talk about the readout, what you're seeing on the screen, the B&G interface. Some of you guys had comments and questions from the last video asking about what these different numbers mean. And I'm going to go through them and, and explain what they mean to us uh, in an applicable way. What does true wind angle or apparent wind angle have to do with, for, for example, how we're trimming the sails? So uh, let's get into it. First of all, it's been, a, it's been an interesting trip. We've had a variety of conditions. We've had strong winds, very light winds. We've used the symmetrical spinnaker. We've used the asymmetrical, the Genoa, the mainsail at one reef, two reefs, and full main. So we've been getting a workout at times. But for the last couple of days, it's been really, really mellow. We've taken a much higher course than initially I was anticipating we would. We're at about 17 and a half degrees north instead of 16 degrees north. And the winds have been a little bit more uh, changeable, changing. We're gonna arrive in the BVI in about five to six days. So kind of in the final stretch. First topic we're gonna talk about is satellite communications. This boat is equipped with the marine version of Starlink. But I was unwilling to leave port without my go-to, the Iridium Go. And I'm gonna explain why I feel that the Iridium Go or Iridium Go Exec is absolutely essential equipment on a trip like this. First of all, no knocks against Starlink. Starlink is, it's incredible. I, we've had video calls with family back home. I've talked to my mom, I've talked to my talked to Megan from the middle of the Atlantic Ocean and the quality is incredible. Here's why Starlink is not appropriate as a go-to communications tool aboard a boat like this, in my opinion. It works great, it hasn't even hiccuped once, but there are really three reasons. First of all, Starlink is not portable. If we had some sort of emergency, we needed to get into a life raft, we cannot take Starlink with us. We would only have the EPIRB to set out the distress beacon signal to await rescue. The second reason is that Starlink is a power hog. Uh, it's, if you look at the website, it, the marine version of the antenna takes between 110 and 150 watts of energy. It's in this cabinet right here, and it, the cabinet is warm. It's generating a lot of heat. 150 watts at 12 volts, that's well over 10 amps continuous. So it's a big draw on the batteries. It's, it's as big a draw probably as all of our refrigeration put together. So yeah, it's a power hog that you can't leave on at all times. So really Starlink should be cycled on and off. It's, it's not a communications tool that should be on all the time, in my opinion, on a boat like this. And the last reason is because Starlink runs on alternating current, AC power. So the batteries are supplying all the energy on board right now, um, and the batteries are, are topped up by the solar panels and by the alternators on the engines and by the generator. This boat has a generator. And then that energy is converted into AC power, alternating current through an inverter. And that's what Starlink needs to run. So even if Starlink is working perfectly, we're dependent on the generator and or the inverter to make it work. If either one of those fail, or both fail, I should say, then we don't have Starlink as communication. So those are the three reasons we need to have a backup source. And uh, 
I guess you could say this, this video is, is kind of sponsored a, a little bit. Predict Wind, which I think is a fantastic company. They have fantastic products. They lent me the Iridium Go Exec for this trip. Um, so not a huge value there, but I would be saying these things even if they didn't. I, I just think that the Iridium Go and Iridium Go Exec are essential offshore tools. First of all, they run on 12 volt power. So you can go right off the batteries or a DC-DC converter to get the power for the Iridium Go or Go Exec. They also have internal batteries, so they'll run on their own for a time. They are also transportable, they're mobile. If we have to get into a life raft, we can take the Go Exec with us. So that's essential. And one of the biggest reasons that I am so in love with the Go Exec is it's so much faster than the Go. It's using a, a different constellation of satellites than, than the Starlink is. And while it's not as fast as Starlink, it's, it's fast enough to send email and most importantly, our weather grid files. We can download our weather, the predict wind forecast models, which I rely on heavily, to do our routing. In fact, our data from the boat, our wind speed, our wind direction, the boat speed, is all being uploaded to Predict Wind where they're creating polars for the boat. Polars are a, uh, well, how do you describe polars? It's a way of determining what your boat should be doing speed-wise in terms of any wind speed and direction. And it's something that's best done computationally. So that's all done back on some servers with Predict Wind. It's all fed through what's called the data hub. So the Go Exec talks to the data hub, and the data hub talks to our NMEA backbone from BNG. So it's constantly gathering all the information, and then we can send it places. One of those places is our tracker. You can go watch our progress across the Atlantic uh, online. Uh, maybe I'll put a link in the description for that. So, the Iridium Go Exec, I feel, is essential offshore uh, equipment. I feel it's so essential that I was not willing to leave on this trip with the unit not fully operational. So we had to change out the antenna, uh, and actually, Robin, Robin changed out the antenna because I was too scared to climb the mast. Uh, but everything's up and running, and I just think it's, it's a fabulous piece of gear. And next, I want to talk about the B&G interface. Uh, you've got basically three or four choices. There's a couple uh, smaller players in the market. Furuno is out there, but it, it's basically Raymarine, B&G, and Garmin. Those are your choices. And my favorite is B&G for sailing. Uh, I just really love the intuitive layout. And when I say intuitive, I mean it's intuitive after you look at it for a little bit. So why don't we shift over there and talk about the interface and the display, and I'll tell you what the different numbers mean, and hopefully I can relate it to what we're seeing outside right now, because all the cameras, all the views you're seeing are simultaneous. So let's talk about the interface. First of all, we're on the main chart view, and we've got some basic details on the right side, our boat speed, our speed over ground. Hey, speed over ground a little higher than our boat speed. We got some current with us. We've got the true wind speed, that's the wind speed over the water, and there, then our apparent wind angle and apparent wind speed. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that in just a second. Let's shift views, and I'm gonna go over to something called sail steer. This is like a compass rose that's got a whole bunch more information on it. Okay, I'm gonna take it piece by piece. First of all, uh, 299300 at the top. That's where the boat's pointed, and we're heading to 295, kind of north-northwest. Behind it, you can see kind of that orange thing, it looks like an hourglass. That is our course, that's our course over the ground. And you'll see that our course is to the left of the direction we're headed. Okay, that's because we've got some current. 
look down to the center of the compass rose and you'll see that arrow, that blue arrow with 1.6, it sometimes goes up to 1.7. That is the current, or I guess you could also say it's, it's part of our drift, but that's our sideways movement through the water as calculated between our heading and our course over the ground. So the heading is 298 and our course over the ground is 289, 290. So you can see there's like a seven, eight, nine degree difference between the two. Let's talk about the numbers on the left hand side and what that means for us. At the top, AWA, that's apparent wind angle. That's the angle of the wind that the boat sees, and most importantly, that the sails see. Right now, we've got the autopilot set to follow the wind. We're in wind mode. You can see the spinnaker kind of collapsing there. Hopefully, the, the autopilot is going to turn us to the left a little bit, and there we go. And then we see the spinnaker refilling. So the apparent wind and especially as the autopilot looks at the apparent wind, allows us to sail this boat without touching the wheel really at all, at least in sea states like this. The true wind angle, that's the wind angle over the water. And this is important because the boat will accelerate and decelerate and the apparent wind will change. When we're flying something like a spinnaker, a flying sail, we really want to be careful that we don't go deeper than about 155 to 160 for a couple reasons. First of all, we get too deep down to 165 or 170, we could be in danger of accidentally jibing, and that would be really, really bad for the rig. But more importantly, as we sail deeper, the mainsail is going to begin to blanket the headsail. It's going to blanket the spinnaker, and the spinnaker will, it'll deflate, it'll, it'll collapse. And then we get this really big jerky moment. So the TWA, the true wind angle, helps us uh, guide the boat in a way that the spinnaker doesn't collapse. Below that on the left-hand side is AWS. That's the apparent wind speed. So the true wind speed, which I'll get to, is 15 knots, but since we're going downwind, we feel less wind across the boat. So the apparent wind speed, what I feel standing on the back deck, is 7.4, uh, 7.5 knots. Again, this is important for the sail because the sail has a maximum apparent wind speed. I'm gonna guess here, I actually don't know the real number for this spinnaker, but it's probably around 15 knots apparent wind speed. So we could be, we could be out in winds of 30 knots, right? But as long as the boat's going 15 knots downwind, the apparent wind speed's gonna be 15. Uh, see what that math is, what that math looks like? And we've got the true wind speed at 14.3 knots and boat speed, that's, that's pretty, uh, pretty self-explanatory. Okay, let's talk about the, the speed over ground and how it relates to our course made good or our VMG. I'm gonna switch views now and I'm gonna show you more of a hybrid look. I'm gonna show you a lot more numbers. All right, now our boat speed and our speed over ground is in the upper right hand corner. Our boat speed, our speed through the water is 8.6, 8.2 knots. Let's look at the number to the left, just a little bit of boat speed. You see that VMG? That's velocity made good. That's how quickly we're headed towards our destination. So our boat speed can be really, really high, but if we're not pointed in the right direction, we're not getting to the destination as fast as we might like to. So we're always playing around with our course and the sails and the wind angle to try and increase our VMG, our velocity made good. But let's look at the two graphs that are kind of in the center lower part of the screen. These are the trends over the last hour for both the true wind direction and the true wind speed. We're always trying to see how things are changing. The boat is going to alter course, right, to stay in the same direction with the wind. But what's happening to the wind over the water? Because as the wind direction changes, 
our boat direction will change and we may need to go think about trimming the sails, letting them out and, and changing our heading so we get a better velocity made good. We're also looking at the true wind speed trends so that we can see if the wind is increasing or decreasing. And always with an eye to what's happening around us. What are the clouds looking like? What are we seeing on radar? Um, I can bring up the radar view. It's actually overlaid on the chart right now, but I'll bring, bring up the actual radar that's on right now. And it's not showing anything because, well, there's nobody out here. We are, we're all alone. What, Robin, when was the last time we saw anybody out here? It's been days. Four or five days. Four or five days. We haven't seen anybody, not a tanker. You, you saw a little boat at one point, didn't have AIS on. No. Yeah. So if we had anybody out here, especially if they had their AIS transmitting, uh, we'd probably see them. Every once in a while, we'll see a little dot pop up. Let me zoom in here a little bit and see, see if something pops up. If it's on the sweep for just a moment or two, this can actually be, it can be birds. The radar sometimes can see a big swell that comes through, um, and it can also pick up little uh, little clouds, little little squalls, which we've been knock on wood pretty lucky with so far. So radar is also very important for us, but mostly just at night. Let's go back to our hybrid view, and this is this is really what we're looking at 99% of the time is this this hybrid view. Um, you can see also on the other part of the uh, control panel I've actually got sail steer up on a different monitor at all times. Uh, Robin's doing some adjustments right now. Well, I guess we got a camera up there we'll ask him what he's up to. We've got repeaters for these displays at each helm, and uh, that's pretty cool. You can be up at the wheel, steering by hand, and looking at all this same information, and it's all independent. So that's kind of an, an overview of our electronics. Uh, one more detail I could, I'm not gonna show you, but I'll just tell you that the boat has, uh, is this, this boat has a, a FLIR camera mounted up on the spreaders. That's a forward-looking infrared camera that I could, I could show you right here on this display. But it's really best shown at night. And it's, it's, it's pretty cool if you've got something to look at. Otherwise, it's just gonna see a lot of water in, uh, in grayscale. So anyway, that's uh, kind of a rundown of uh, satellite communications on board and the electronics that we use. Uh, again, we're like five or six days out. It's, it's really mellow. The, the boat is super duper comfortable in these conditions. We've got winds from behind the beam and we've got seas from behind the beam and they're relatively light. The winds are going to increase here, I think, in the next 12 hours or so, and so we'll be, we'll be picking up speed significantly. So hopefully that, that uh, time to go, the time until we arrive, it improves here in the next 24 hours. Because uh, it's not been a super fast trip, not super slow. This boat really does well in light winds, but it has not been super duper fast. So again, working on the vloggy McVloggerstein video. Uh, I want to tell the voyage story from, from beginning to end, kind of step by step. There's a lot of meat in there, uh, a lot of interesting stuff I've learned along the way. And so I'll get to that uh, probably, well, hopefully next week. Uh, hopefully you've enjoyed this more technical discussion of, of what's aboard here on Moonshot. Uh, as always, a huge thank you to all of you for watching, but especially our patrons who make this show possible. Without your support, we wouldn't be making these videos. So uh, thank you guys for all of your time, and uh, check with me on Instagram, by the way, Nico Kelly with an extra Y at the end. I'm doing daily updates on our progress, little, little nuggets here and there. Take care, everybody. Talk to you soon. Bye.